Today we're going to start on the principle of math induction. And let me state it for you. If you have a set of positive integers, capital S, and it satisfies two properties. The first property is that the set contains the positive integer 1. And the second property is any time it contains an integer k, it then contains k plus 1. If you have these two properties together, then the conclusion is that S is the set of all positive integers. Now, there's nothing to prove here. This is a postulate. This is an assumption. This is how one builds the positive integers from postulates. If you will check in the appendix of the book, there is a full development of number systems starting from basic postulates, starting from the piano postulates, in which you don't even have arithmetic. You just make some assumptions about properties of the integers. And then starting from that, you build everything. You build the integers, the rational numbers, and the reals, and, and beyond. But this is a, an assumption that we're going to take, because this is a postulate underlying the number system. But it has an important cons consequence for us. If someone makes an assertion that has the form Sn, where it's a statement that takes on a truth value for every positive integer n, if we want to prove that statement, then it suffices to do two tasks. First, verify that the statement is correct when n is 1. And second, under the assumption that for some positive integer k, the statement is true, explain why that implies that it is also true when n is k plus 1. Now, if you can do the two tasks, then you have shown that the statement is valid for all positive integers n. All right, we're going to do a number of examples of this. But I want to comment that computer science students, anybody who's written a program, understands induction down at some intuitive level. All right, now, here's a function. And, and, and I'm using uh, C, but it doesn't, this, the, the coding is sufficiently elementary that I think anybody uh, can, can understand what's involved here. And I'm skipping the part about declaring variables and declaring functions. I'm just launching into it. So I have a, a, a function, my function, my very own function. It accepts an integer as its input, and it returns an integer. And, and here's the definition. If you input to the function the integer a, it returns 42. And I hope you, most of you are familiar with the idea that in all programming languages, you can insert comments. And in C, you insert comments in between slash star and star slash. If you're writing in C++, a double slash, you can use these comments also, but a double slash will work. All right, so what does the function say? If A is 1, return 42, else return 3 times my function evaluated to A minus 1 and subtract 120. Okay, now I'm asking you, what is the value of my function of 3? Take a minute and see if you can't figure out what that is. You'll have to figure out what my function of 2 is first. And while you're working on this, if you get stuck, feel free to talk to anybody that's around you. Don't yell across the room, but uh, uh, feel free to talk to the people right around you. See if you can figure this out. This should take you about 12 seconds. 11, 10. What's my function of 2? I'm hearing 6. Yes? Everybody agree? So then what's my function of 3? 
What? 100 and 102. Minus 102? Okay. But now, isn't it the case that you could calculate my function of n for any positive integer n? I mean, if you're willing to, to do the arithmetic. But, but you see, that's what I'm saying about the intuition here. Any person who's written a program would say that function is defined for every positive integer n. And you are using induction when you do that. That's why it works. Let's take a, a more challenging example. And I, this one is a, is a famous problem. It involves a, a sequence called a collapse sequence. So I've got two programs up here. One, I've got a little program which takes an integer and provides an updated value. So what does the update value function do? It accepts an integer a, and then it runs a test. And the first statement is, if a mod 2, so the, the percent sign in C is a modulus operator. So it's saying, if a mod 2 is 0, and I wrote as a comment, in C, the percent sign is a modulus operator. If the residue class of A is 0, return A over 2. Now, in, in, in ordinary English, what's that saying? If A is even, divide it by 2 and return half of it. Else, what do you do? Multiply it by 3 and add 1. So what would the update value of 26 be? 13? because 26 is even, what would be the update value of 17? 52. 17 is odd, so you would multiply it by 3 and add 1. OK, now on your papers, let's do the collat sequence. So here's what the collat sequence does. It inputs an integer a, and it prints that integer back out. That that second line is just a print line. And uh, many of you are, are familiar with this syntax, but uh, the percent %d in there is, uh, is just the syntax. I want to print it as an integer. The, the backslash n is a control character. It says, re do a carriage return after you do this. So you're going to put a, an integer on every line in your output. And so whatever your integer is, print it. And now here's a do loop. While the integer is not 1, replace a by update a in loop. OK. On your notes, apply this function starting with a being 13. Start with a equals 13 and apply the collat sequence to it. So out loud, 13, 40, 20, 10, 5, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. It stops at 1. OK, why stop at 1? If you, if you didn't stop, what would you do? 1, 4, 2, 1, 4, 2, 1. Uh, they get real boring. So when you get to 1, just stop. The conjecture which is attributed to collats, is that regardless of what you start with, you will always reach 1. And this has been verified uh, for numbers out to this big. But there is no proof. When I was uh, 26 years old, I met a famous Hungarian mathematician named Paul Erdős. Uh, he's arguably the most uh, famous mathematician of the 20th century. He, he died um, now about 15 years ago. I met him when he was in the peak of, of his uh, powers. And I, I, I was 26. Erdős asked me, 
Beetle. And the story is that Erdős called all mathematicians by their last name except me. And he called me by the name that no one calls me by. So he said, oh, Beetle, what are you working on? And I said, well, I heard this little problem. It, it goes like this. If you give it an integer and it's even, divide it by two. If it's odd, multiply it by three. And, it, and he just stopped me and he said, Beetle, do not work on that problem. It will not be solved in my lifetime or yours. Okay, so, <laughs> so th thus far he's fifty percent correct, and he, and he, and and he's a very very smart man, much much smarter than 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 I am or ever will be. Uh, so do not w work on this problem. It will not be solved in my lifetime and probably not. Yours. It's very, 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 very hard. And there's nothing to, there are no tools. There's nothing to, to build on. So a very challenging problem. But, but if you like to play with codes, you might uh, take a big, you'll need a big integer arithmetic package because the numbers, see, when you're multiplying by three and add one, you know, you can hit a, a, a string where it's odd, it's odd, it's odd, it's odd, it's odd. And so the numbers will get really big and, and then they'll come down, and then they'll get big again, and come, it goes round and round. Uh, but then start playing with some big numbers and see how long it takes your your program to get to one. And of course, who knows? You might be lucky. You might uh, write a code, substitute in a number, and and uh, and somehow be able to prove that. No, you won't. You see what will happen? is your computer will give out before, because there's no way the computer is going to disprove this. It will just be running and running and running and running and running. Okay, so don't work on this problem. You can play with it, but don't work on it. Okay.